All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch Podcast, and today's episode is a beauty. We have a so-called greedy investor who's lifted the veil and showed us exactly what the cash flow looks like, and we reveal, is he actually a greedy property investor? We also pose this question, folks. If I was to give you a dollar and all you needed to do is give me 10 cents in return, is that a fair exchange? Ben, we look at that. What else do we cover? Bryce, we also have a great question around the sandwich generation. Who are they and what is their challenge around getting into the property market? And finally, in what's making property news, we focus in on asking rent. So we see some of the latest data in terms of the markets that are running hot and some of the markets that are also easing and cooling in terms of the marketplace. Markets that are running hot. We want to know that, folks. Let's rip into the show. Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance, and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome to the Property Couch Podcast, and welcome back to you too, Ben. How are you? Mate, I'm well, and look, good to see the nose is starting to uh, to clear up after being, you know, smacked by that uh, by that flying caliper or whatever it was. What was it called? Yeah, what, what, do, what do you call it? Um, I've been saying it all week to everyone who's asked me. I can't even feel it. It starts with C. And, it does. And the, the people who climb down mountains do it um, all the yeah, time. Yeah, I've, I've got one in my hand here. Carabiner. Carabiner, that's, that's it. it. There we go. Yeah, Flying so, um, carabiner. For people listening to this, Ben, they're going to go, what are you talking about? For those who are yeah. watching on YouTube, I've just got, I've got clocked on the nose. So thank you. It is um, it is, uh, it is getting better. Hey, um, this is a pretty good week for me. Collingwood didn't play. It was a bye. We don't have to, <laughs> we don't have to listen to you uh, grandstand on A, that you won, or B, how you got robbed. So that's pretty true, good. True, true. All right, well, let's let's move on then. <laughs> hey, um, we, we got a TPC survey. We did it last week. Uh, yes. We want to tell everyone about it again this week, Ben. Thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash tell us. Folks, this is your way of giving some feedback on, we've done it once before. We want to compare the results to what we did a number of years ago, just to see what the content is that you want us to provide. Ben, we are conscious of a couple of things. One, we're about to enter our 10th year, right? We're coming up to our 10-year anniversary um, on in February next year. So we've been doing it for a while, um, but we also want to make sure that we're relevant and we want to make sure we're doing the stuff that people want to hear. So yeah. this is your chance to let us know. Anyone who goes and fills in the details gets a free course from us, Ben. Uh, it's the case study course that accompanies our book. So the case studies that are at the back of the book, we've unpacked those. You did a wonderful job with that. So I recommend anyone who wants to get free access to that, Ben, should just go and give us some feedback because it's well worth the effort. And then anyone who gives us some really insightful feedback, we'll curate them. The team of Stigs will say, that one there is a good one. We'll be giving away some 100 bucks for insightful feedback. I think there's a few prizes that we're doing there. So folks, thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash tell us, get involved, let us know what you want to hear. Um, We are super excited about that. But today, uh, we've got more questions from the people of the podcast, Ben. Um, it's been a little theme for us uh, in March and now in April, just to really get to the cold face and see the questions that people have on their way to uh, $2,000 per week as the mission, as the North Star, as the purpose around lifestyle design. So we've got more of that today. Uh, we've got a bit of feedback from folks that are a little uh, little upset, Ben, about how um, uh, property investors are being treated as ATMs for the state. So we've got a little bit to talk about that as well. And then we've got some um, stick around to the end because we've got a question regarding uh, one of our favourites here, Ben, um, Morgan Housel. And why does Morgan say that property investing is not the right thing to do? So we cover that as well. But before we get there, Ben, uh, we'll get into Mindset Minute um, theme today and how to stop the cycle of overthinking. Um, Clearly, um, uh, you and I are thinkers, Ben. Um, It is part of our DNA. So uh, I'm often doing head miles uh, on certain things. We've spent a bit of time talking about how action is the really secret source of anyone who's successful in any endeavor, really. If you want to play guitar, you've got to start. If you want to invest in property, you've got to start. So I came across this. Um, her name is Layla Hormozzi. She said, how to stop the cycle of overthinking, right? So the way she does it, her hack is this, do it wrong, do it imperfectly. That's, that's the overarching theme, right? 
Uh, because when the goal is to be perfect, it increases our anxiety about the issue or the situation and our outcomes tend to be worse. That's important intel. So the brain is paradoxical. If you tell it to not look at the elephant, guess what? It actually looks at the elephant. So if you find yourself caught up trying to do everything perfect all the time, just remind yourself it's okay to get it wrong. It's okay to be imperfect. This is really good advice, Ben. As you, as I've said before, most of the uh, mindset minutes are just notes to self for me, um, yeah. and then everyone else gets to um, listen <laughs> to my musings. But this is definitely a note to self for me um, because. When you and I first met, I was a raging perfectionist. I reckon I've really tempered that over the journey. Um, I, it still rears its head every now and then, but um, I'm well and truly more done is better than perfect these days, which is good, which is part of the action um, orientation that we try to preach on this podcast. But um, it's okay to get it wrong. It's okay to be perfect. So by commanding yourself to do it wrong or do it imperfectly, it's a powerful statement to break us out of the anxious cycle that we're constantly thinking and overwhelming ourselves. So... Interesting for people to think about that as they lead into the weekend or whenever they're listening to this podcast, Ben, because it's that, that advice is actually simple and hard. Um, it's a really simple yeah. concept. Um, the hard part is just laying the new track in your mind. It's, it's, it's being able to overcome the propensity to want to say, let's get it perfect before I start to actually, doesn't matter if we get it wrong, because it harks back to the, um, the yeah. one-way, two-way, two-way door questions that we've, um, that we've talked about recently with, um, with your mate, Jeff. Yeah, and if I remember myself, Bryce, as a young investor in my late teens, early 20s, when I was just consuming as much information and I wanted to be the next Warren Buffett, um, it, it can be um, quite challenging, right? Because you, you're, trying to, you're trying to say, I can be the perfect investor. I can invest perfectly and never make a mistake. Um, and that, that, that leads to a lot of procrastination. So I really like this statement on the sense that, um, you know, if, if you don't, you know, what does Ma Michael Jordan used to say? You used to miss every shot that you never take, yes. right? That's a perfect that's example right? mm. in, in, terms of, even in terms of that. I mean, my, my caveat on this is when you're dealing with large amounts of money, um, you don't just want to have stabs in the dark. Um, you want to have some knowledge and, and understanding behind what you're investing in. So from a money management point of view, but the same thing, you know, like we, we have the more platform and, you know, make money simple again, money smarts is all about getting a systems and a process. You'll still never be perfect. We don't want you to be perfect in, in sort of thinking about every cent, but we want you to be able to develop systems and processes that allow you to um, move forward and build habits and behaviors around that and not try to be perfect in those things because as humans, we mentioned it last week on the pod, we are imperfect. We are human beings. That's why we're humans and we're not robots. You know, So, so that, that is really important for, for people to understand. But this is about moving past procrastination and, and not taking action because you need it to be perfect. Uh, but I want your money management to be rules-based and I want your investments to be um, historically based in evidential data over the long term. If you understand those things, I think, you know, you'll just let the, the power of compound and all of that sort of happen for you as well when we start thinking about this in the context of money. But in terms of what you're talking about, which is in life, don't try and make everything perfect. You put so much pressure on yourself and the anxiety, which is which is what she talks about here in her little um a little uh, statement. So I think it's really valuable. Yeah, one-way doors or two-way doors and you're right. But even in property investing, Ben, like the first step is to clarify. The second step is to uh, evaluate. The yeah. third step is to plan. The fourth step is to implement. So the it's the fourth step before you actually get to the, the bit where it becomes a one-way door. But everything yeah. up until that point is still a two-way door. So it's kind of yeah. just um, doesn't matter. Uh, you don't have to have the perfect plan. You don't have to have the perfect uh, first clarify because you can refine that along the way. Because uh, property investing is is a is a process, not an event. So, anyway, folks, if you are an overthinker or have the propensity to overthink, um, do it wrong, do it imperfectly. All right, let's get into today's show, Ben. We have got um, some listener comments. We've got some questions. We've got Beautiful. an encore um, segment at the end of this as well. So, um, first one is from Tom Decker. Um, now you might remember that name, Ben. He is a, a summer series guest of ours. He was way back on episode, well, not way back, 454. Talked about how to create a $5.54 million property in your 50s. So that was a wonderful chat we had with Tom. Yeah, portfolio, yep. 
This is what he said to us, Ben, not not speak pipe. This was uh, via the written channels, Ben. So hi, Ben and Bryce. Loving the content after listening for more than three years. There's currently a lot of noise in the media and social platforms about how us greedy investors are pushing up house prices and rents, as well as rolling in wealth as a result of the negative gearing and capital gains tax rules, which I believe need to be clarified for everyday Aussies and certainly for the politicians who are using this agenda for their own political benefit. As a property investor, I have and will continue to work as diligently as possible to pay tax on my rental properties every year. Yes, this is my goal. (laughs) What did he say? To pay tax on my rental properties every year. For the past three years, I have had the privilege of paying tax on income received from my rental properties, although this may change in the coming year as a result of interest rates and increased costs to hold the properties. Now, Ben, you've got more to say on that. You've actually got a graph to talk to about that very thing a bit later yes. on, so stick around for that. Negative gearing is a safety net for the investor, which supports reducing the loss. It does not create a windfall at all and simply means that if, for example, I made a loss of $10,000 on rental properties in a year I am on the and I am on the top marginal tax rate, my loss is reduced by $4,700. However, I'm still making a loss whilst providing accommodation. So I'm a little confused by the politician's assumption that we buy property just so that we can claim back some tax and lose money. Makes little sense. And it is my view that removal of this safety net will simply increase the cost of rents. Okay. Capital gains tax discount, which was brought in to replace indexing, And based on my research, the impact, i.e. the difference between before and after capital gains tax discount, is actually in favour of going back to the indexing model, where investors made slightly more. I am proud to be a property investor providing good, safe, and uh, as affordable as possible accommodation for my tenants. And whilst I accept that I cannot always make money on the rents collected, I am ultimately doing this to support myself and my family in retirement, where I will most likely continue to pay tax on rental income happily until my final breath. Important point to highlight there, Ben. Seems to me that the politicians want me to consider and live to wants me to reconsider, Ben, and live off the government in my retirement rather than contribute. Really good points you make so far, Tom. The record needs to be straight, uh, set straight on the Greens agenda. The Greens were for the environment when it was top of the social media charts, but now suddenly they are anti-investors party because this has a higher profile. We as a group of investors need to create a voice that helps inform all people of the facts rather than the political BS exclamation mark. I would pay to watch or listen to you guys interviewing one of these politicians. Ben, you're trying to get in front of them and they won't let you. Perhaps mm-hmm. by putting everyone straight, we can get back the focus on the priority, which is increasing supply and improving vacancy rates rather than pointing figures. Keep up the great work, gents, Tom. Ben, I don't think you need much of a little of a nudge to um, have a swing at the Greens. And so we do have a lot of people who listen to this podcast who listen to the Greens. But the point here is that it would be nice to have some of the 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 headlines around policy statements be more grounded in some science around the data rather than um, the political um, uh, game that is just trying to be popular. Yeah, Bryce, I think there's a lot in what Tom says here, which, I mean, it's almost a drop the mic type of um, commentary, right? Because, yes, I'm in a similar boat to Tom in the sense that I had really strong, positive uh, property growth during the leaner interest rate time period. So I had lots of you know positive passive cash flow coming on and and I was happy to pay the tax when it came to running my small business um, in, in, incredibly the costs have gone up significantly in running small businesses um, that are private rental accommodation businesses so we are talking about primarily the interest rate number one but we're also talking about the increased compliance costs number two we're also I- increased insurance premiums, number three. And then in some states and territories, we also have increased land tax bills or state-based tax bills that are also adding to that. So in what's making property news, I'll give everyone an update in terms of what's happening in regards to the increases in rents. 
because what we are seeing um, is absolutely it's politically favourable right now to denounce these greedy property investors. It makes for a good narrative for a political agenda. But what Tom is trying to highlight and what we also would like to remind people, and we're going to go to some data in a moment, is that if you are a self-funded retiree, that basically means you will continually be adding back to the pot, back to the government coffers in terms of the rental income that you will pay tax on. Um, if you ever sell the property, there'll be a significant capital gains tax amount also paid, and you will be zero burden in terms of um, the amount of support, social support that you might get through pensions or other means of support that you'll get from the government. So you will be means tested, which will eliminate you from all of these other costs. In addition to that, you're also, again, helping some of the state governments to provide their services through the land tax and so forth that you'll be paying. So I just find it interesting that, that we've got to continue to keep reverberating this message um, to make sure. And I know we're talking, you know, we're preaching to our converted community here in terms of, you know, as, a, as an aspiring Australian, we want to basically be self-determining. We want to basically say, if it is to be, it's up to me. And I'm going to build wealth slowly, boringly for my family to the $2,000 a week that we talk about for our community as the baseline. And that's effectively what we're trying to do here. So I think it, it's an important message. And, and I think what Tom has done there is articulate it really nicely. Um, so I would, you know, listen to Bryce reading that out again in terms of the critical points here. He's saying, I, I feel I'm happy to be paying tax on the passive income that I'm receiving, and I'll be happy to continue to keep paying that. But if you take all of that away, in other words, if you take all of those costs, you know, the income that we earn, and you take all away all of that away in cost, well, then my return on investment, my risk adjusted return just doesn't stack up. So I'm going to get out of this investment class and I'm going to put my investment dollars elsewhere. And we know what that will do subsequently to the amount of rental accommodation being supplied. And, and that will ultimately lead to higher rents. The reason why we've got really strong rental growth at the moment is clear that effectively these small business operators are trying to recover some of their rent. At the moment, the vast majority of the people who are carrying over 60 or 60% 60 or more in loan to value ratio are actually subsidizing their tenants um, at the moment in those small businesses. Yeah, so I, I think a couple of things just to highlight there. The, he said the privilege of paying tax, yep. um, providing accommodation, and ultimately I'm looking to make sure that I don't live off the government. So I think, um, I think you know, early in that... Um, in that piece, he said, look, I'd like to um, clarify for everyday Aussies and for the politicians. I think I think largely it's just, um, I think the cry is for politicians just to have some science-backed, numbers-backed, yeah. um, empirical data-fact um, observations rather than um, doing doing what politics is, which is ultimately a, popula uh, a popular uh, popularity contest, right? So, um, but thank you, Tom, for that. Now, we've got a, another one that we want to read out here too, Ben, which was sent to you um, in your capacity at Picker. Um, yep. This is this is from Ben. Um, asked us not to say his surname, but it's not you, just for just for the avoidance yes, of for the record. <laughs> uh, dear, uh, and this was written to um, uh, the Member of Parliament, right? So, dear Premier, Minister for Housing and Housing and Homeless Service Department of Communities, Housing and Digital Economy, Member for Everton and Member for Stafford. I write to you as a concerned property investor who provides two rental properties for two separate families, one in Everton Park and one in Kedron. So we're talking about Brisbane here, Ben. Yes, we are. I've provided we're... these rental properties to two long-term tenant families who have enjoyed quiet and well-maintained occupation of them. Due to their respective cost of living challenges and life situations they have had, the rental increases have been nominal at best and nothing for one of the properties over the past 12 months. At the same time, I have experienced significantly increased compliance costs and risks in providing these rental properties in Brisbane. I know of many property investors who have made the decision to divest their properties as a result of the stage one reforms and will expect to see many, many, many more as a result of these stage two reforms. These reforms seem to ignore the fact that we all want a balanced environment where private investors can confidently and sustainably invest into housing that is made available for tenants to rent. 
and for tenants to be able to secure available housing at a reasonable rent and to have quiet enjoyment of these premises. In the current environment, property investors are carrying the considerable burden of rapidly increased interest rates that are only partially, in brackets to a very small proportion in my case, being shared with the tenants. To put it into dollars and cents, the interest rate increase of 375 basis points since May 2022 has made the private provision of housing unsustainable even before the Queensland government continue to try and make this even harder with these reforms. The impact being a reduction in supply of privately funded housing. With over 800,000 in mortgage loans that I have going forward, this will result in an increase of $30,000 in interest costs over the next 12 months. In brackets, no principal, just interest costs. With a property rent increase of $50 and $0 for my properties per week over the same 12-month period, that would equate to a $2,600 cost recovery. That's a $27,400 shortfall to be covered by my wife and I. In our situation, our tenants are paying only 8% as and we as the owners are paying 92% of the increased costs. I have over the last few days spoken to my property manager in brackets who I pay and employ a team of and who employs a team of people to discuss the divesting of my properties. This of course will have the likely impact of taking a further two properties out of the rental accommodation pool of houses available for tenants. No doubt an unintended consequence of these short-sighted government decisions and actions. Thank you for your attention to this matter. I look forward to a thorough review of all of the unintended consequences that I have raised in my email and look forward to your response. Kind regards, Ben, not you, Kingsley. Again, another really sensible, articulated letter to members of parliament just outlining the story from the property investor's side. Now, we've mentioned this before on the pod as well, Bryce, and that is that it is a bit of a lottery in terms of um, for a tenant, which property owner they get. There might be a property that's been in the rental pool for a long time, call it 20 plus years, and that might be a fortunate position for that landlord, you know, that private rental accommodation provider. And they may not have any outstanding mortgage on that property. So the, the luxury they have is to be more sympathetic um, to the tenant that might be in that particular property. And though those people might be the lucky ones. But what we've heard just now in Ben's story is a clear story of the challenges that he and his wife are facing in terms of the risk-adjusted returns and the economic benefits of providing that accommodation. And that's that's the challenging piece here for those people to understand. And, and so this is in reference to um, the stage two reforms that are being proposed by the Queensland government. So um, wearing my picker hat, we're basically saying to the Queensland government, be careful what you wish for here. Um, we have evidence and if you're watching the YouTube channel, I'll just bring up a couple of charts now. Um, we have evidence of the impact in the Victorian property market. And you can see for the first time in recorded history, the first time in recorded history, uh, rental accommodation supply is going backwards. I repeat, is going backwards. And so that is through the 133 reforms in addition to the land tax recently introduced in Victoria. It's, it's, it's just too much. And so what we're seeing is an exodus of maybe longstanding property investors uh, in that particular market. So um, if you're not watching the YouTube channel, please take a moment to go across and have a look at those charts that we'll prepare inside that YouTube channel there to show exactly what's happening. But it's, it, you know, this is, this is the challenging bit, Bryce, in terms of, um, you know, we heard from Tom saying that, I will do what I think is appropriate and right, but part of that is in running a business is how much subsidy do I want to part, you know, can I can I afford? And that's Ben and his wife's story. And Tom's sort of saying, I'll, I'll move the rents according to what I think is reasonable given my current situation. And if he's high earning, you know, he can be a little bit more flexible than someone who, you know, really does rely on that rental income to be able to, you know, maintain the business. Now, there might be some people going, well, that's good. Sell the property. 
you know, and then so, so then a first home buyer will buy that property or another investor will buy that property. Well, we all know that the, the market mechanism isn't as simple as that. We all know that the market mechanism does adjust uh, according to, you know, how people move in terms of compositions in households. So if that was the case, those two families now need to go and find other accommodation. And if those two properties were bought by owner occupiers, it means that there is a reduction in supply. And that's what we've just been talking about in, re in regards to what's happened in Victoria. So again, this is the unintended consequences of what, you know, when you think about the feedback that they're getting from 5% of their tenancy base, in, in, you know, through the tenancy unions and the tenancy associations saying it's just really tough out there and we're not getting enough support and, you know, you know there's, a, there's a bad bunch of bad actors who are property managers and they're being greedy and the, and the landlords and the owners are being greedy. You know, that, that's a very small proportion of it. If you ask um, most landlords to show you their books, um, it'll, they will clearly be able to articulate to you that there is a significant increase in the costs of running their small businesses and they have difficult decisions in making in terms of how much they pass on and how much they can recover. I think the um, I think uh, to add to that, Ben, the I think the important what we're trying to do here is um, um, we, we're trying not to be a political podcast, right? Number one, so we get that there's there's a spectrum of listeners who've got different um, political um, views and persuasions, right? What we're trying to do is is have a have a swing at balancing the headlines that we have like David and Goliath right we cannot compete with all of the the headlines across all of the media outlets that say that property investors are greedy landlords so we're just trying to have a little chip at saying the the, the vast majority of landlords uh, are to Tom's point getting a getting a a, a loss uh, uh, of $10,000 um, a loss, like out of pocket, ten thousand. Now, some of that loss might be non-cash, mm. i.e., depreciation. So let's let's say the out of cash um, position for Tom is nine and a half thousand. He's got five hundred dollars worth of depreciation for the year. Let's be conservative and say it's a thousand dollars as a deduction for the year. So he's got nine thousand out, actually legitimately out of pocket. Well, yeah. If if he's getting four thousand seven hundred dollars as a tax refund because of it. He is then, uh, I've got to quickly do my maths here, Ben, is 5,300. Did I get that right? No, 4,300. 4,300. Yep, 4,300 out of pocket. So when when Tom gets his tax refund back at the end of the year, or if he's chipped away at it and he gets it back in each pay packet each year, or if he's self-employed and he reduces the amount of pay as you go that he has to contribute to the tax department, he's not actually... He's not actually, um, and this is the bit that we want to land right. He's not actually just getting that tax refund and going, great, I'm off to the travel agent. Great, I'm off to Airbnb. Great, I'm off to book my favorite restaurant. He's actually just saying, that's just contributing a little bit to what I'm out of pocket. And so just trying, so, because you've got three distinct phases in in um, the property investing journey. The first mm -hmm. phase is accumulation. The second phase is reducing LVR. And then the third phase is lifestyle by design. And if you if you if you do our get rich slow scheme, Ben, that's a 20, 30 year journey, right? So why shouldn't you be in the privileged position after 30 years of taking risk and being self-funded to be able to be a self-funded uh, property investor that allows you to make choices that you want to do? But that's at the end of 20, 30 years of effort, Ben. That's at the 20, 30 years of patience. That's at the 20, end of 20, 30 years of delayed gratification. So, yeah. But it's that first phase, which is the accumulation phase, which statistically the ATO backs up is, we, we've quoted 73%. Over the journey, that's dropped down to about 71%. So a few more property investors are coming to the, the market, Ben. But the vast majority stop at one. And the vast yeah. majority in that accumulation phase are not in the privileged position where their LVR is low. Their LVR is probably at 106%. And then over the first 10 years, it drops down ideally down to the 80, 70 mark. And if they if they, if they they want to actually get some form of meaningful retirement, they quickly bring that LVR back up across the portfolio because they want to buy a second one. So I guess what we're trying to do here is just remind, I know we're preaching to a group of investors, right? But yep. it's helping people and equipping them with narratives and reminders and timely reminders, hopefully, that when when they're up against these headlines and people are having pot shots at the greedy investors, it, 
it's most likely commercial property investors that have got positive cash flow. It's not the residential investor that's got positive cash flow because those those glory days of being able to get positive cash flow on residential property seem to be behind us. Um, so it's 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 really um, it's really really important that we try in our David and Goliath battle here to to neutralize the narrative to remind folks that it's it's not it's not cash flow positive for people in their pockets. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and we used to say on the pod that when you factored in some of the depreciation and also the the general loan to value ratio, that a good rule of thumb it was a rough rule of thumb. But if your loan to value ratio was between 60 and 65% of the value of the property, you were usually going to be neutrally geared and starting to move into positively geared territory. Now, what we mean by neutrally geared and positively geared, it says, okay, once I cover the costs of my property, um, ultimately there's a little bit left over for me. Now, what's happening in, in terms of governments asking for more compliance and safety and those types of costs and minimum standards cost and then insurance coming in on top of that, and then land tax or other taxes increasing, all of a sudden now the loan to value ratio needs to come down. And, and I haven't done the modeling on this, but I'd be estimating around 50 to 55% loan to value ratio before you're now positively geared. So now when you are starting to be positively geared, that does take the tension off having to lift rents. When you're not, then ultimately you're trying to recover those costs because at the end of the day, you're trying to be self-funded as a retiree. Now, again, we haven't advocated for buying 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 properties. That's just not who we are. We're sort of saying two or three really good ones to supplement your income in combination, in combination with your super is going to bring you a very comfortable retirement and what we referred to earlier, self-funded. If it is to be, it's up to me. No reliance on government. In fact, you're actually contributing back into the pot you're paying it forward by continuing to pay taxes for the next generation and the services that the government provides across the nation. And it's probably a really nice segue, Bryce, into the next couple of charts that we want to look at in terms of the facts. Yeah, yeah. So let's lead into that. But it's kind of, it's, it's, um, what, what I want to ask folks is, um, we'll set this up, Ben, and then you, you'll, you'll run through it. But would anyone think it was smart to avoid paying 10 cents? And lose receiving a dollar, right? That's that's how I want to frame this up. Would yep. would anyone think that that was a good exchange? I I do not want to pay ten cents anymore, but if I don't pay ten cents, I lose the ability to get a dollar. Um, now, hopefully, everyone's just going. Let's let's mad. Yeah, that's I love it. That's a nice little carrot to bring us into the conversation. So so yep. take it away. Yeah, so let's have a look at what we're talking about here. So we've got a couple of charts, and so obviously for those on audio, we'll we'll try to explain them. What we've got in front of us is the ATO statistics, and this is pretty reliable data, right? Ultimately, everyone has to submit a tax return each year, and then the, the ATO does a really great job in providing and synthesizing that data to get some insights out of that. So inside the, the, the statistical charts that we've got here, we're looking at rental income and deductions. And so we've got 2016, 17, 2017, 18, 2018, 19, 2019, 20, and 2021, which is the latest data that we've got. Now, when, when they look at it, the government's basically saying, they say, so gross rental income um, is the first uh, value. Then we have rental interest deductions. So that's ultimately reducing the rent that we're getting because in, uh, interest deductions are claimable or deductible. Then we've got capital works deductions and then we've got other rental deductions. Now, the bottom line here is, if, if I explain it, in terms of net rental income, in 2016-17 financial year, the government had to pay $3.3 billion um, back to or did not receive in terms of tax receipts because that's ultimately what we're talking about. So, so this is tax saved to the investor, but this is obviously a so-called cost um, you know, um, to, the, to the government. Now, 2017-18, it was $3.6 billion. 2018-2019, it was $3 billion. And then it obviously started to change in 2019, 2020, and it was only 0.2, so 200 million effectively um, of money paid out to these investors. And then in 2020, 21 financial year, something dramatically happened. And that is obviously as interest rates uh, collapsed on the back of COVID um, and the, the RBA had to obviously set a, an emergency cash rate, that ultimately meant that 
um, all of a sudden those negatively geared properties turn positively geared. And so the government received $3.2 billion. Um, well, sorry, let me clarify that again. The net Collect rental... Rent. Yeah, the net rental income was $3.2 billion. And so whatever the tax rate was, that ultimately for those individual investors, they would have to have paid tax on that positive income that they would have received in the government. Now, I know all those people who are already jumping ahead, skating towards where the puck is, um, they know that obviously interest rates have gone back up. That's what we've just been talking about. And so we do anticipate that in the next couple of years, um, it will be around that sort of $3 billion figure again in which the government will be, in, in, you know, in the Greens' view, subsidising these greedy property investors. Now, this is where it gets interesting because what we also know through the data um, is that rental income is not the only income that gets taxed in this country. We also tax the sale of an asset through a capital gains tax. And so what we also see in the next chart um, if you're um, watching along on YouTube, you can see that, is that this is the amount of revenue that would be taxable by the government and re collecting receipts from these investors. So what we see here in terms of the 2021 year, so I won't go through all those other years, but for ben, just for everyone's benefit, you and I went to the ABS website uh, yesterday and we just made sure that we had the latest data that they had. ATO, uh, yep, ATO website, that's right, exactly right. right. ABS. Uh, ABS, ABS, that's right. Yeah, ATO. So we are dealing with the most recent data, even though it's not right. sort of current. Yeah. So what we see in this data is individuals. So, and, and I think it's really nice to put it into context. Uh, in terms of share capital gains, individuals made gains of 18.6 billion. In terms of real estate, it was 27.3 billion. In other assets, it was 28.4. So that could be the sale of small businesses or goodwill in companies. Then companies, it was 12.1 billion in shares. It was 7.3 billion in real estate. It was 10.9 billion in other assets. And super funds, obviously this is where the big shares are, 54.7 billion um, in capital gains on shares sold, uh, 2.5 billion in real estate for self-managed super funds. And then other assets, 53.7 billion. So that would be managed funds, ETFs and those types of things and REITs, real estate investment trust. So let's just pause on this point. So now what we what we don't know from the ATO is a breakdown of residential versus commercial. And we have requested this uh, on many occasions and we hope one day that they will be able to separate it basically by address in terms of working out zoning. So there's no, it still can be anonymized, but we anticipate that the 27.3 billion um, would be majority residential real estate. And we also expect that even people buy properties, residential real estate in companies, that's 3.7. And then obviously the super funds, 2.5 in real estate. So the combination of those two end up around that sort of 36, 37 billion mark. Now let's say we wash out all of the commercial real estate where Bryce and I are anecdotally suggesting that it's about $30 billion of receipts that the government will be able to tax. So this is back to your point, isn't it, Bryce? Yeah, well, that, that, so again, is the transaction, if I give you a dollar, you have to give me 10 cents, would you do it? Well, any logical person would say yes, but that's, that's kind of what we're presenting here. If we, if we give you 30 bill, would you pay three bill? And logically, you'd think that you would say yes, right? Now, there's no science in in that. Like, we don't exactly know how much the commercial is. And we're trying, you know, a lot of commercial buyers buy in entities. So we're, we, we're making some assumptions around that. But what if what if we go super conservative, right? Would you, would you, would you receive 20 billion in return for paying 3 billion? Would you, would you receive 15 billion in return for paying 3? You probably can ask that question right down to, you know, would you receive 10 billion in return for paying 3 billion? So again, we're just trying to, um, and there was a lot of data and there was a lot of numbers for those just listening on audio. But ultimately what we're saying is there's, there's, some, there's some receipts being given out in the form of negative gearing um, incentives, but there's been some receipts coming in in the form of capital gains that, um, that will be received by company. Now, some people say, well, there's 50% 
uh, exemption on um, if you held it longer than 12 months. So, so clearly what we're saying here is at some point that if you, if you stop the incentive of the 3 billion, you also, you, you've got to be prepared to accept the cost of that. And unintended consequences come out of our mouth a lot because if we stop the 3 billion worth of incentives, we are going to stop some portion of that 27 billion minus the capital gains tax exemption at people's marginal tax rates. You will not be receiving that. And we haven't even talked about um, stamp duty, Ben, which is a, an incredible. Which, well, that's a, you know, as a state based tax being a federal based tax, but, but effectively, you know, so when, um, Max Nather Chandler, have I got that right? I think I have. Max Nather Chandler, uh, yeah. When he comes out and claims that there's $3 billion that we're giving to these greedy property investors, in in return, those so-called greedy property investors are actually giving windfalls of around $30 billion of taxable receipts to the government. So if you slow down the, the, the rate of capital growth in the, the market, of course, that means that those capital gain tax receipts are also going to significantly reduce. So do you want to, you know, to, to kill off the bird that's feeding you, the hand that's feeding you? Because the reality is, is what's going to pay for all of the education and the health services and potentially also the, you know, the, the, the likes of the, um, the Navy and the Army and all of those defence services? Like these are big costs the governments need to run. And so that's probably why behind the scenes you don't hear so much of the big political parties sort of, you know, that's the unintended consequential risk of this is that if we were to lose 50% of those capital gains in tax receipts, the government's going to have a massive deficit. It's not going to have enough money to provide all those other services. So it's it's a classic case of be careful what you wish for um, in this particular sense. And that's why we wanted to raise that today. And we want you, as as obviously someone in the community, that needs to be educated, right? Down at the pub, at the dinner table, whenever the conversation comes up about the, you know, people sort of saying rents are too high and it's unfair, just be careful what you wish for. We're a very we're a very fortunate country in terms of the wealth that we hold, but we store most of that wealth, i.e., 54, 55% of it, in our properties that we own. And so again, it's another case of when those people downsize um, from those family homes and they don't need the, you know, the extra bedrooms and they, they downsize in retirement, they get a windfall in terms of those capital gains because it's principal place of residence. And they're able to then also additionally self-fund their retirement. And that also means, you know, buying a caravan um, from a caravan supplier, that means buying a new, that means creating jobs you know, and discretionary spending that helps people get employed. So, you know, when you've got the likes of what's uh, Jayco, the big caravan provider, or whatever it is, you know, like, you know, that, that's, that's employing thousands of people across the country. And that's how the economic flywheel works. You don't want to have a smaller flywheel. There's less money to go around. And less money basically means one of two things, less services or higher taxes, you know, in terms of if you want to keep delivering these types of services, ultimately that's going to have to be paid for by someone or we're going to have more austerity and we're going to have less support services. So that is, that's the trade-off that people need to understand that the conversation that we're in, in terms of talking about this. So folks, we know we preached to the choir, but hopefully that's helped you um, with some narrative around us um, greedy property investors um, and what it looks like. And um uh, what's at stake if we don't get it right? Hey, we've got a question from uh, our a TPC listener asked to keep her name uh, anonymous. So her initials are MC, she'll know. Um, now, uh, she talks about the sandwich generation of women, Ben. What's the sandwich generation of women? All right, let's have a little uh, look through her question. Again, this is a written in question. It wasn't a speak pipe question. I'm keen, I'm keen to hear from single women and in brackets and men who didn't start investing till their 40s. There are so many of us. It's a real feature of my generation. A lot of single women you've had on your program started their investment journey before 2017. So we're able to buy multiple properties with equity and before the serviceability constraints came in. If you're a single female on a middle income today, don't have parental assistance or any kind of inherited wealth, and you start investing a bit later, it seems impossible to get past one to two properties. I'm keen to hear others who might have done that in today's environment, especially how they've met and creatively dealt with serviceability challenges. 
For what it's worth, I think there's a large sandwich generation of women who never married, but whose parents never bothered to educate them about property because they just assumed it was a ladder they'd start climbing once they got married and had children. But that hasn't happened. So they're kind of in wealth limbo. I know so many people in this situation. I'm also just keen to hear more from people who started their investment journey late, age 40 plus in general, and to hear what they've been able to achieve. Cheers and thanks for a terrific program. Hey Ben, um, there's a couple of things and we'll we'll riff on this, but um, Tom started his um, portfolio in his 50s. Mm -hmm. Um, We have had a number of people start in their 40s, but I think what we really want to talk to here is MC's point, uh, TPC listener MC, um, is that, okay, um, they've done that in a previous window of time that had a previous set of conditions that were unique and bespoke to that window uh, in the timeline. But here we are now in a timeline where someone's starting from scratch, um, facing serviceability constraints and not being able to talk about um, what they've done. They're trying to work out um, how they can actually get to the starters gate. So I think Um, what I want to say to MC is if you look through the back catalog, we'll look to link it in our um, show notes as well. Some people have done it in their forties. But I think there's, there's some important things we can talk to here, Ben. Yeah, there are. And let's start with some real basics. So to obviously be able to acquire property, you need two things. You need a deposit or equity in an existing home and you need income. And income comes from obviously, you know, exertion, physical exertion in terms of running a business or being an employee of a business. And there's also income that comes off uh, the property in terms of the rental income. So it's that income, less your cost of living, that also then influences your borrowing power in terms of what you can be able to achieve. Um, So when we're looking at a case by case situation, we're hoping that that some women um, and or men who have, um, you know, divorced. Um, hopefully they're coming out there with some sort of level of financial balance. And then it's what you do. There's a couple of really important things about what you do with that money. Um, Ideally, um, you know, without giving direct advice, um, if you're coming out of that with a couple of hundred thousand dollars, being able to, um, you know, sort of invest that into a principal home or a place where you can live rent free um, is going to be really important. And obviously that might carry with it a mortgage, depending on also which state and territory you buy in. And and, and I appreciate that. And that then obviously makes it harder because one, you've got to service a mortgage on a single income, and then you're ultimately looking to be able to to get into the the other property. Now, if you've also got kids, um, that makes that challenge even more. So the way in which lending calculators work, the more children you have, the less borrowing power you have. But if you were then also overlap on top of that um, decisions that are being made by APRA, our financial services regulator, um, and the Council of Financial Regulators, which also includes Treasury and also the um, the RBA, is at the moment by design because of inflation, they are really trying to limit the amount of borrowing power that's available. And we've talked about this recently in terms of, so the unintended consequences of that is it's pushing all of the investor demand into the cheaper, more affordable markets. And that's un- artificially inflating those values and it's making it also the, un- the other unintended consequence of making it really hard for first home buyers or people trying to, to buy in that afford. You're just pushing all the demand into that area and, and ultimately that's putting accelerated value returns in those particular markets. Now, that's, that's a, a consequence of uh, the, you know decisions that they made around trying to slow down the economy um, and get inflation into check for the sustainable future and living standards. So, so I understand what they're doing, but that's the unintended consequences. So back to MC's question, um, there's a couple of things that's, that's important here. One or two investment properties in addition to your family home, even one plus super, um, if you're thinking about the $2,000 a week uh, that we talk about, you probably can bring that down to, um, based on the modelling that we would do for households, a comfortable living for a single person, quite comfortable living is around that sort of 70, 75,000. So don't think that you need to get to the 2,000 a week. I mean, 2,000 a week's got to support, you know, two mouths effectively, as opposed to one individual uh, in terms of how they go about living. So holidays are one air ticket and an accommodation, um, you know, as opposed to obviously paying double for, for both. So 
So that's that's the nuances in terms of how we look at it. And it will be a case by case basis when you're actually talking to a professional about, you know, your circumstances and what's best for you. And and in some cases, in you know, it may be best to to look at super as a as a vehicle for that. But I ideally, um, you know, my general advice here is um, re reestablish yourself in your own property so you don't become um, a long term renter. That's that's number one. Don't think about um, investments. Think about stabilisation. Remember, your principal place of residence also isn't part of the pension. You know, and in terms of the um, the assessable pension, so that means that you you know if you've got a shortfall in terms of the amount of savings you got for investment, you'll get you'll get a part pension or a full pension as part of that as well. But for those people who are able to then trap that surplus. Um, the opportunity is going to be one of, you know, we talk about three types of properties. We talk about capital growth properties, we talk about balanced assets, and we talk about cash cows, um, which are yielding higher uh, rental returns. And so we would uh, assess that based on the individual circumstances, in addition to the risk appetite of the household um, and that individual, uh, and then start to look at solutions around where we could potentially find a property to buy for that particular household. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I love to um, uh, to do, Ben, is listen to interviews of people that have usually um, a business that they've created, and I love going back. I love going back into their story when they go, you know, back in the early two thousands, this is what I was doing. Back in the two thousand and tens, this is what I was doing. And I think I think what I'd like to say to MC and everyone who's listening to this is, in twenty thirty, Ben, if we all fast forward, we we will actually come back and we will have um, conversations with people that talk about what they did back in 2022 and what they did in 2023 and what they did in 24 and some of the, the the ways that they found nuances in the market that allowed them to get ahead right so um so so I, I guess the message for MC is this yeah we get it right you you're in a, you're in a window of time where it's more challenging than someone who started in 2017 but someone is doing it and that's someone can be you and that that might mean that you need to um, go and buy uh, a one bedroom flat in a big city um, that allows you to um, uh, be able to get in at a higher LVR and maybe the growth isn't as great on that property but the discipline around you having that security of, of home and also having the 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 I guess the the discipline of, of paying some of that down so you're creating the equity and then hopefully there's some growth in it as well. That's one. Or you might you might say oh, I've got to move out to, um, you know, we're Victorian based, and I might need to move to Ballarat. I might need to move to mm. Bendigo. I might need to move to Shepparton. I might need to move to Albury. Whatever it takes to then go, I can get on the ladder and then build up um, some form of equity that allows you to do it. But it's the it's the it's the the frog that's uh, going across the lily pads on the pond to get the other side. That people, you know, because the argument is, well, what do you, what do you and Ben? Uh, no, you, you guys built it before yeah. 2017 as well. Yeah, but there was there was challenges and stuff that we had to overcome as well. So, I, I just want to say to 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 this listener and to anyone who finds himself in this situation, um, you can be the first person in your circumstances and in your family tree or in your social um, circle that says, "Stuff it! I'm just not going to let this happen to me." Right. Um, I will I will find the nuances. I will find the the you know where water finds its own level, so that I actually can get on. So that then I can actually build the momentum. Then you'll be the person that in twenty thirty and twenty forty that looks back and says, "This is what I did, and this is what I need to overcome, and this is the nuance, in, and this is the lender I needed to use, and these are the chess pieces that I needed to make, um, so that I could actually get it done." Because you're right, Ben. You do need equity, and you do you do need income, and we've got um, yields that are dropping. Um, across across the board so I think I think I you know I, 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 I want to still encourage you MC the other thing is you know contribute to your super so that you can take um, uh, whatever um, government assistance they allow you to get into uh, into property you might want to dollar cost average into some um, some uh, ETFs um, into managed funds that allow you to at a smaller incremental chip um, build up, um, the ability to save for that deposit. You, there is there is a need to be creative in how you build that initial uh, requirement of that equity and the initial um, requirement of income. The other thing, Ben, is finding someone else who is exactly the same as you, who has exactly the same path. 
no no um, bank of mum and dad, no silver spoon, no born pre to the uh, start pre to and get together and look for the nuances in the lending that allow you to actually pull resources and get in and have an an exit plan that allows you to then um, cut your own individual path as well. So I feel like. I feel like I get you, MC. It's 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 certainly more difficult, but it's certainly not impossible. Yeah, I, I want to build on what you're saying there, Bryce. Around this, so you know, necessity is the mother of invention. What what MC is highlighting to us is um, it's hard to get access to money, and it's hard to get access to a deposit in terms of that. So, team up to Bryce's point, and we're seeing some new lending opportunities starting to emerge. You know, in terms of products meeting the market. Uh, and we'll see more and more of these types of products that that allow for helping build the deposit up or shared equity or whatever that is. But joint ventures, which, you know, 10 years ago, we were probably saying we're a little bit more scared of those types of things in terms of getting that. But but that's usually for younger people who just don't know their direction for for, you know, for the sandwich generation of women and or men um, who find themselves in their mid 40s. Um, you know, the brother might be able to help out. But have, when we say help out, it's actually we're going to buy a 50-50 stake or whatever that may look like, 75-25 stake in a property. And some of these new lending products uh, where we talk about in the past, we said one of the biggest risks was joint and several liability attached to the mortgage. Well, if you go um, tenants in common and you work out the percentage of what tenancy or ownership you have and you find a lender that doesn't have that joint and several liability, meaning that what the lender is structuring up in the loan documents is your liability is only on your portion of the lending and your um, fellow investor or owner of that property's their portion is only proportioned to their lending. So it's it's almost like isolating it out that they can't chase any of the extra money. And they're doing that because usually the loan to value ratios are lower on those types of products, which means that their risk of not getting their, their loans back um, is actually going to be quite low. So that's the type of product innovation we're going to continue to see uh, in terms of combating that challenge. But as we say, what you don't want to do is you want to let the market be the market. The more you try to influence the market generally, uh, you're going to have stagnation and you're going to you're basically going to uh, impact the market more generally. My final question to these people who find themselves in this situation, and I know this can sometimes be um, difficult because it's a very stressful time that people might be going through in terms of relationship breakdowns to find themselves in this situation. Um, and so I want to talk to their story first because they will get some form of windfall as the separation of the assets and the sale of assets or whatever might happen. One of the things that we we often see happening is um, as part of the refresh and resetting of the life is that there will be narrative around spending on lifestyle elements or things like that. And the biggest one in my case that I see often is the car. So they say, oh, well, look, you know, I want to I want to start a new life. And so rather than rather than sort of putting that money into a deposit for a home, they go and drop 50 or 60 grand on a nice car because it makes them feel good, gives them that sugar hit in that earlier stage. If your car is unreliable and unsafe um, to take you from point A to point B, then I, I completely respect that uh, a new car might be, or a, or a demo car or a secondhand car, relatively new, might be something you need to spend money on. But try and make it at the smallest amount possible for you. Don't get enticed to, to, to give yourself a treat after dealing with such difficult times because ultimately by doing that, you are robbing yourself of giving yourself an appreciating asset that's going to help you in the future. And so that sugar hit that you're going to get is going to cause some pain um, down the track. And I know that sometimes can be difficult because we want this narrative of resetting ourselves and feeling, um, you know, feeling uh, internally um, satisfied with ourselves. And we sometimes do that through a little bit of retail therapy. Please don't do that um, if you're thinking about your finances. Yeah, MC. So we, we and anyone who relates to this, we want to be super sensitive of the situation you find yourself in. But um, uh, Ben always says, if it's if it's to be, it's up to me. So I think that's the the overarching um, message for anyone who's a sandwich generation, where um, there will be people who who navigate it. And um, the question is, are you going to be one of those people that navigate it? I mean, it's it's never been easier to create a second income, Ben. Whether that's simply driving an Uber or spending a fair bit of time studying 
uh, something on YouTube that allows you to build a, a, a second income through a business, right? So yeah. it's never been easier um, to do that. So, um, but really it's going to come down to, okay, your circumstances are sandwiching you to a certain extent. So the next question is, and what do you, what, what do you plan to do about that next? Um, and I get, I'm a white privileged male who's not in the same position as you. I get it right. So, yeah. but at the end of the day, um, my favorite quote is life is not a Disney movie, Ben. No one's coming to save you. Um, so if that's the case, uh, we got to just get on with getting on with it. Right. So, um, so for those people, they've got to, they've got to find ways to get it done. So we w- we want to crowdsource some of this too, Ben, to help people that, are, that find themselves in this situation. So we want to crowdsource what are the ways that people are doing it mm. um, so that we can share it. So there's a couple of ways. Um, leave a speak pipe, come onto my um, Instagram, send me a message. Um, but the other thing, Ben, is uh, uh, if you go to the propertycouch.com.au forward slash my story, um, that's, that's where you leave your details for summer series. And yeah. I'd love to feature a ton of sandwich generation women and men, but in this case, um, MC is a woman. Um, what are you doing? What have you done? What have you done to take action? How are you able to help people like MC who's looking um, for for ways to, to move forward through this? What have you done to be creative to get the deposit? What have you done to be creative to find the lending products that allow you to get in? What have you done uh, to increase your servicing? Um, through whatever creative strategies you've done uh, to improve your income so the banks see that. So we want to hear from you. So we definitely want to crowdsource um, the sandwich generation um, tactics um, so that people can actually implement them. So please, um, please reach out to us in some capacity. But Nirvana would be, go and register your details for uh, the summer series. And even if you're a work in progress, let's talk about you as a work in progress on summer series. Um, so that others can benefit from that. So um, uh, good question there from MC. Hopefully that has given you something um, to go and chew on there, MC. But um, uh, we, we just want to acknowledge we get it, right? Yeah. We get we get that there's some stuff there that um, is not of your making. All right, mate, so we've had a big show. So we've obviously gone through some commentary um, there with Tom and Ben, why? Um, and then we also just uh, covered that sandwich generation question there from our listener MC. So um, a fair bit covered. Hopefully there's a fair bit of ground for people to go and uh, ponder for uh, the week until we tackle next week. I uh, wanted to do an encore comment here, Ben, um, which we we say that the Property Couch is the insider's guide to property finance and money management because real estate is an insider's game. Often wealth creation can be an insider's game at times. Um, so uh, we wanted to read out just a sample of um, scores of reach outs that you and I um, received. This one is something that you received. Um, and we think it's super helpful for anyone who's outside of the traditional uh, lane that we're in, in terms of giving advice, just to see um, how this works, Ben. So I'll read it out, then we'll do a little bit of commentary um, at the end. But um, this is uh, this is an email that you received. Hi, Ben. I'm reaching out to discuss a potential partnership that could introduce an additional revenue stream to your business. That's a good start, Ben. He's well, thinking of you. My, more, I'm always interested, Bryce. I'm thinking of you, Ben. Nice way to – that's a good hook. We have a referral partner program. All right, Ben, this is getting meaty. In place that stands out from the rest. Ooh, okay, that's good. The other 6,227 emails, we've got the same. I'm interested to see how this stands out from the rest. Here are some of the reasons why, Ben. Number one expertise. Our team specializes in catering to property investors and those seeking their dream homes, representing top builders, developers, and land estates nationwide. Oh, that is Ooh, expertise. Big reach. Man. Big reach, Bryce. Big reach, matter expert. So that's a tick. Number two, diverse portfolio, Ben. We offer a range of property types. Oh, that's good. We've got, we've got choice here, Ben, including townhouses, House and land packages in brackets with flexible contract options. That's flexibility is important. Uh, dual income slash duplex opportunities with rental potential up to $950 a week. Mm. Well, that's enticing. Um, high yield co-living properties fetching rents up to $1,000 a week in brackets with returns of up to 9%. Mm. Next one, NDIS slash SDA properties 
with potential, here we go, potential gross incomes of up to $195,000 per year in brackets yielding up to 20%. Ben, that sounds too good to be true, but it can't be because he's, he's, he's trying to find something that could, that could benefit you. So let's remove our skepticism. The next one, apartments tailored for owner occupiers. And then the next one under that, properties suitable for SMSF investment. Wow, they've covered Ooh. everything, Ben. So not only do they have expertise, but they do have a diverse portfolio. So that's another tick. Number three, this one I love. You know, they're really starting to speak to us here. Client-centric approach. Oh, okay. We guide clients through every step from initial consultation to key handover, ensuring a seamless experience, and it is a free service. Free service? Free service, Ben. Oh, wow. how do they make their money? This is compelling. I don't know how they make their money, but it's free, mate. So then this is the beautiful part, Ben. This is how it comes back to you. Okay. And as a referral partner, you'll be given a generous referral fee, Ben. Wonder how much? How well, much? it actually says how much it is. We will give you a generous referral fee of $10,000 plus GST for each successful referral. So, Ben, if you give them a name... Oh. And they don't buy. They're not going to pay you ten thousand. But if you just give them a name, and they do buy, mate, ten thousand bucks. Ten thousand bucks plus GST, mate. So you don't even have to pay the GST out of it. So therefore, if you were to do, let's say you refer ten people, Ben, you make a hundred thousand. My God, and Bryce, that's all you have to do. Ten thousand people who listen to the podcast. I'm right. going to be rich, Bryce. I'm going to be rich. And but you don't have to do any work. Just give ten names. That, I know. That actually you buy. So payments are made in two installments, Ben, in alignment with our payment structure. So folks, just so you know what that means, they pay half at unconditional and then half when it settles, just so you know what that looks like. If you're interested in joining force with us, please schedule a time to have a Zoom meeting with me via the hyperlink to do that. Thank you. Best regards, this person here who's a property strategist, and we won't say their name. We won't say their company, Ben. But um, folks... We've obviously um, put on our cynical voice and we put on our playful voice. But just if we're the insider's guy, just letting you know, we have scores and scores and scores of these reach outs on a very regular basis, just to give you a little insight into what happens on the inside. One name referred to one of these people means that we could earn $10,000 plus GST just for referring a name. And they will take care of the rest. So Ben's little cynical question of how do they get paid? They get paid a lot. They get paid by the developer and that $10,000 that we get paid gets paid by the developer. And guess who ultimately pays for that, Ben? The poor the person buyer. who's buying the property. And look at the NDIS property prices. 195000 a year yields up to 20%. NDIS, it's affordable. Like how are the governments agreeing to this stuff? Yeah. Like it's it's incredible. But it, there's a perfect example that we've also talked about. When the government is the main buyer, there's always a premium paid. Just yeah. never forget that. And who's paying that? We as taxpayers. But that is ridiculous that they can offer 20% yields or incomes of up to 195000 Now, I understand the property has to have special needs in terms of, you know, handrails and, and certainly, you know, for disabled access and so forth. Yeah, we're not having a go at the need. No, we're no, no, we're not having a go at the need. But it's, it, it is absolutely absurd. And I've seen, this is the latest fad. I've definitely seen heaps of these things starting up. So I'm getting a lot of these sort of reach outs. But here's someone who hasn't done any research about our Empower Wealth business. It had done no research about who we are and has blindly found me on LinkedIn or whatever or and just pinged me. And to Bryce's point, we would have had thousands of these over the journey, right? So it's unfortunate that we've actually read this one out. But, it, you know, this unfortunate person might be, you know, their manager might be saying, actually, I wrote that copy. They're talking about, <laughs> they're talking about us. But here is the... Oh, no, we, we don't hang people out to dry. We're not going to no, mention their name. And we we're aren't. Not gonna... On the YouTube, we'll, we'll, we'll block it out. So yep. that's that's not what we're doing, but we're just letting people know how it works. Yeah, this is this is how the game works. And so this and this comes back to the the social media, you know, ultimately where you are the, the customer and, and you are the product and they're going to just badger you with, you know, because they're making these large commissions. Um, and so literally they only, you know, to, to the point, and this particular person, he's probably also getting himself 
uh, between maybe five and fifteen thousand dollars for his part of it, because you're talking. We've talked about in some cases it's up to fifty thousand um, dollars that the developer allocates or that the builder allocates to provide this distribution channel, um, and so that's and. You know, low barrier of entry. You don't need any real qualifications. You just need to be good at t- talking to people and selling a dream, which is what they do. And so that's why we have we have no say in it. Empower Wealth will never do this. We will never sell new or off the plan or house and land packages. We will never receive a commission from a builder or developer as part of the services we provide. And on this podcast, we will shine a light in terms of those businesses who operate in this space. Um, and they may have some okay properties, but we also know historically the performance of those properties. We know you versus old. Bryce took us through that a few weeks ago in terms of if, you've got, if you're comparing one against the other, it's impossible that the new property is going to outperform the old property, go back to land to asset ratio. And so that's the story we're trying to tell here. There you go, folks. We are trying to give you the insider's guide to property finance and money management, hopefully get an insider's guide to how the world of referral fees actually works in the property space. Um, You want to be dealing with someone who earns an income from you as the client only. Mm -hmm. Uh, They do not want to be any conflict of interest or muddying of the waters because then that's when the agenda is not for you. So there you go, folks. We just thought we'd uh, chat that out for you today um, to just, I mean, Hopefully, you know, we're known for that in across the journey on the podcast, Ben, for, for trying to get people away from that stuff and get them into um, established properties as well. Hey, my life hack today, Ben, is a reel I saw. Um, we'll put it up on the video. Uh, there'll be a, a link in the show description. But basically, uh, I, I, uh, my, my wife showed it to me and it was um, I thought it was pretty clever, right? So, um uh, you know, um, as you know, we're, we're, we're going to uh, we're going to Europe for four weeks in the middle of the year. And so uh, what it was, was a, um, a, a girl who was planning the outfits for her trip, right? So um, we're obviously, uh, Andrew and I are having the conversations now, what suitcases do we need to take? How minimal yep. can we be? Yep. So the idea here is this. Um, so for audio uh, listening, it's basically a young girl who's actually standing in front of a mirror and taking, uh, getting into her outfit um, that she wants to wear while she's away and she's taking a photo. Then she goes to the next outfit that she's going to wear, takes a photo. And then the good thing about this, um, and I don't know how to do it in, a, in anything other than Apple, Ben, so yep. um, forgive me. But what I don't know if you know this, Ben, if you, if you take a photo and open it up in your Photos app on an iPhone um, and it's full screen, you can hold the button and what it does is one of the, at the one of the option hold the photo and then some options pop up, and that one of the options that pops up says add a sticker, right? Ooh, and, okay. and what it does is it takes an outline of this person in their clothes and converts it into a sticker, mm, and then okay. you, you say, well, why is that important? Well, then what you can do is you can then open up um, just a note. You know, you can fancy I use Evernote, but you can use Apple Notes or whatever note, and then you can just put um, Monday and paste the sticker. Hmm. Tuesday, paste the sticker. Wednesday, paste the sticker. So all of a sudden, you've planned out the outfits that you want to wear when you are overseas or going on a holiday or whatever. And then you go, great, okay. Then I know what to pack. And then you get the opportunity to do it minimal. And then it's just on your phone, no stress whilst you're away. You plan for when you've got something significant, might be need something more formal. Hmm. Versus something great idea. So that's that's my life hack today via my wife. Um, and for those of you that want to check it out, we'll put a link to the um, to the Instagram reel that I found it from, um, so that you can check it out. But really clever uh, way. Well, that's plan. good planning, isn't it? That that is good planning, especially when you only have a certain number of kilograms on different internal yeah. flights in different countries. And yeah, no, well done. Yeah, well plan done. to become what you plan to become. Plan, plan to wear what you plan to wear. <laughs> plan to wear what you plan to wear. Very good. Um, what's making property news? Yeah, I thought we'd just talk. Uh, last week we saw um, the the guys at uh, Domain, their research area for their March quarterly rental report. And so we promised to just talk about where the rents are going. And we can see, I'll try and get this in order in terms of year-on-year change. So Perth has had the greatest increase year-on-year at the end of the March quarter of 18.2%. Now, that's then followed by Melbourne at 14%, followed by 
Um, I think Sydney is next um, at, um, what are we talking about, 13.6%. Then you've got Adelaide at 13.5%. Canberra's only 0.7 of 1%. Um, you've got combined capitals at 105 combined regions at 8%. So it gives you some idea. Now, Hobart and Darwin pretty much flat. Actually, Hobart's probably down a little bit in terms of where they're at, but it just gives you some idea in terms of the rent. So it, just to give you some idea, uh, Sydney is 750 a week, Melbourne's 570, uh, Brisbane's 620, Adelaide's 590, Perth is 650, Canberra is 685, Darwin's 650, Hobart 550. So just on that alone, you can see, and what I've been telling you about the Melbourne story, I'm predicting um, that in the next 12 months, Melbourne will absolutely be at the top of the tree here for two reasons. One is they're losing a lot of their rental supply um, as investors are tapping out because uh, the government is anti-investor in Melbourne and Victoria. And the fact that it's actually at 570 versus, say, Brisbane at 620 and even Adelaide at 590, there's there's a real reason. I mean, you know, in terms of incomes that you earn in Melbourne, it's the it's in the top four um, cities in terms of income. So there's a disproportionate. So there's more there's more leg room that Melbourne can run in terms of making rents, uh, well, increasing rents to an affordable level to recover the the current shortfall that some uh, investors are experiencing. And if you remember what we talked about before, we said that the new land tax threshold will actually be a tenancy tax, and that's absolutely going to pay out in Victoria where uh, effectively um, these tenants, um, based on the government's decision to increase land tax, are going to ultimately suffer from that decision. So there you go. Um, I, I do believe that the others will start easing off a bit, but uh, Melbourne, no, no, it's um, it's going to have a chronic, chronic rental shortage. Mm, which, uh, which will send them north, as we've talked about a number of times. So thank you, mate. Um, there you go, folks. Hopefully you've uh, got a fair bit out of today's episode. Just want to thank Tom, uh, ben Y and MC, uh, TPC listener, for their contribution today. And I guess we've got to thank the person who sent you the email as well, Ben. They've certainly Yes, made a yep. contribution. reach out to them. So thank you very much for sharing that, uh, that spruiking email. <laughs> yeah, so we appreciate the spruiker making it onto the Property Couch podcast as well. But, mate, uh, until next week. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. See you next week, folks.